Merry Christmas and welcome to this episode of Faith in Your Recovery. I'm Randy Davis, your host. We appreciate you joining us. We're going to bend our own rules a little bit here today, and we're sure that, or we hope that'll please you, touch your hearts. We want to get into a little Christmas theme more than the total addiction recovery style of interview that you get from us. As a part of A Better Life, Brianna's Hope, we want to share our faith with you. If you've tuned in to any of our 60 episodes that we've produced so far, you probably heard me say that in my previous life, I was a pastor. That lasted for 35 years and continues today in many ways. So for a little while here, I'm going to relapse into my former preaching habit. Please accept this as our Christmas present slash message to you. We appreciate the opportunity to deviate from our norm and share our faith. The title of what I want to share with you today is called The Miracle or The Moment. The scripture I'm going to use is Luke chapter 2, verses 6 to 20. Let me share those with you. While they were there, the time came for her to give birth. She gave birth to a son, her firstborn. She wrapped him in a blanket and laid him in a manger because there was no room in the inn. There were sheep herders camping in the neighborhood. They had set night watches over their sheep. Suddenly, God's angels stood among them, and God's glory blazed around them. They were terrified. The angel said, Do not be afraid. I'm here to announce a great and joyful event that's meant for everybody worldwide. A Savior has just been born in David's town. A Savior who is Messiah and Master. This is what you're to look for. A baby wrapped in a blanket and lying in a manger. At once, the angel was joined by a huge angelic choir singing God's praises. Glory to God in the highest heavens. Peace to all men and women on earth who please him. As the angel choir withdrew from heaven, or excuse me, withdrew into heaven, the sheep herders talked it over. Let's get over to Bethlehem as fast as we can and see for ourselves what God has revealed to us. They left, running, and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in the manger, seeing was believing. They told everyone they met what the angels had said about this child. All who heard the sheep herders were impressed. Mary kept all these things to herself, holding them dear deep within herself. The sheep herders returned and let loose, glorifying and praising God for everything they had heard and seen. It turned out exactly the way they had been told. What I'm going to do at this point is take on the role of the way I I see it might have been for those sheep herders. I'm going to introduce myself as Ananias. My two best friends are part of this as well. They're Matthias and Jonathan. Well, we drew straws. I lost. So I'm here with you today, and Matthias and Jonathan, they're they're tending to the flock, okay? But I want to share our story. A moment, a miracle beyond belief. You can call it a miracle. We're going to call it the moment. I remember it like it was yesterday. It was so cold and damp out there in the field. Dark, Very few stars because of the rainy, overcast conditions, temperatures in the mid-30s, and all of a sudden, in the darkness of the night, there appears a rustle, and suddenly, there are angels among us, the brightest light I've ever seen. There was something special about the lead being, and he spoke to us. He said, don't be afraid. I can assure you, we weren't afraid. We were terrified. 
after we got our breath back and opened our eyes, the angel spoke, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You'll find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host, that's a whole army of angels, folks, appeared with the lead angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. Well, then they left. And when they did, we looked at each other, wondering what we had just experienced. We were beyond dumbfounded. We were still trying to make sense of what we had just witnessed. No way could we process the experience. No one wanted to speak first. Then I broke the silence by asking the question, what just happened? Why? Why'd those angels come to us in the field instead of the king in the palace? Why? Why a societal lowlifes instead of the rich and the highly cultured? Understand, slaves and probably even lepers were above us on the societal ladder. I see this, folks, as a great parallel to those who struggle with addiction the way the world will look down on them until they get an understanding or until it's their loved one. And I'm not saying they are innocent of all guilt. I'm just saying they too have a disease that holds them back and causes us to do some unfair judgment. Then we went ahead. This message, this word from on high, how could that be intended for us? Uh, maybe, yeah, that was it, the angels. The angels delivered this message to the wrong people. You know how your packages at Christmas sometimes don't get there and you get a hold of your, your carrier, your delivery folks, and they tell you, well, take a little time, go out and search the neighborhood. Maybe it got delivered to the wrong house. Uh, I think most of us have experienced that, okay? And that's what these... The sheep herders were feeling. Why in the world did the angel come to us? And let me be honest, I don't have an answer that will satisfy you. But I know how the story goes after that. I, I gave a moment to Matthias. I could tell he had something he wanted to say and understand. Matthias was our adventurous one. He was as impetuous as they come, and he was always up for a challenge. Yeah, he suggested that we needed to follow through with what the angel said and go see this child for ourselves. That was risky. It would mean leaving our sheep to the, to the risks of thieves, wild animals, or even them running away. That could mean our livelihood, our family's next meal. It, it could mean losing our jobs and maybe, maybe even losing our lives. Don't be fooled. Obedience carries risk, but something inside, something kept pushing us forward to where we knew that we had to take that next step. And that meant leaving our sheep and our sheep herding work behind, at least for the moment. So together, we agreed and decided to head for Bethlehem. Bethlehem, in the Hebrew, understand, means house of bread, a place of substance and sustenance, a place where you can be fed. We were about to imbibe in the best filling we had ever had. So as quickly as possible, we took off on the run. We decided we would take the risk. But understand this too. We had one clue and one clue only. This is what the angel had said. 
this is what you're to look for, a baby. A baby wrapped in a blanket and lying in a manger. Off we went. That was it. That's all we had. No lights. No flashing signs. No pointing arrows. No star overhead. Uh, don't be fooled. That came a couple years later when the Magi appeared. No early GPS. No maps. No hints. No cell phones. And you know what made this more difficult than ever? Was the fact that the town of Bethlehem, which at this point had a population of approximately 300 individuals, because of the governor, Quirinius, telling folks they had to go back to where they were born to be a part of the census, that town of 300 had grown by a multiple of anywhere between three and ten times. That village of 300 was now somewhere between 900 and 3,000. That was not going to make this any easier. That was going to make it much worse even than when my wife, Martha Rose, lost her needle in the haystack. And you've all searched for that needle before. Well, I can tell you this, it was impossible to get around as the streets were nearly shoulder to shoulder with travelers there to pay their tax and be a part of the census. Understand, our clothing gave us away and caused us to be rejected and ignored, unless you can't be laughed at as attention. Have you ever had your appearance dictate a response from others that preconceived notion because of the way somebody looks. And let's be honest, you know, it, well, you know what I'm talking about. It can be tattoos. It can be those, those rings in the ear or elsewhere. And that list goes on. That too many times we get that preconceived notion. That's how we felt. Nobody cared to know us before they judged us. And there again, lies a great parallel to the battle for those who are struggling to get out of addiction. Oh, yeah, by the way, we hadn't bathed for days. When you're out in the fields, you just don't go home every night and get a chance to take a nice warm shower. Our clothes, man, did they stink. We could tell it ourselves. We were tired and knew we weren't welcome, but forward. We went. Somehow, it was as if our steps suddenly found meaning and direction. We could hardly feel our feet hit the ground. A peace and a hope fell over the three of us. We were in total agreement that we were on a mission directed by someone or something beyond above, much bigger than us. The closer we got, the faster we moved. Suddenly, a sound caught our attention above the raucous and the chaos. We heard the faint cry of a baby in that village of thousands. Step by step, we noticed the cry was becoming louder and more distinguishable. We knew that we knew that we knew we were close. We looked at one another. Then we looked down the end of the path, and there, there was a cave lit by a single candle. We ran to it as fast as we could, and there, amidst the dung and the straw, the sheep and the bugs, was a sight unlike we had ever beheld. In the manger, wrapped in a swaddling cloth was a baby. Beside him, his mother knelt, and his father stood. With our hearts touched like never before, we recognized we were in the middle of something special, a moment that would change us, and even change the world forever. There, in that moment, in that lonely cave, that dark, wet night, 
three sheep herders fell to their knees in tears. Then our third member, Jonathan, reminded us what the angel had said concerning who this baby was. He had been announced to us as the Messiah, as the Lord, as the Son of God. One questioned if it was the same Messiah that Isaiah had referred to as wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. I can't begin to tell you what this was like. Moments, miracles like this, no, folks, they don't happen to people like us. We were completely humbled and totally overwhelmed. It didn't happen because we deserved it, because maybe we deserved it less than anybody else on the planet at that time. But for some reason, we were chosen. We were chosen to climb out of the darkness of the stigmas and the bias held against us to become a voice for God. That moment forever changed our hearts, our spirits, our souls. When we laid eyes on this child, we knew. We knew with every fiber of our being that he wasn't real, ordinary real, that he was beyond that. Any and all doubts were washed away. We sensed what we had never sensed before. We believed unlike we had ever believed. Upon regaining our senses, we decided to leave. When we departed and started our journey back to the field, we had a renewed purpose, a new bounce in our step, a new reason to show up in that field with those sheep, to face that that dampness, that cold, that chill. We knew we had just witnessed the supernatural. We knew this child was a mixture of flesh and divinity, peace and pain, hurt and a hope, the worldly and the heavenly. But something bothered me, whether imagined or real. In the back of my head, I heard the continuous sound of a distant hammer driving a nail in wood. I didn't know what that meant. I didn't know the future that that sound held. But it played out, I can assure you that. Well, we continued our journey. We were unable to contain our joy and shared it with anyone that would listen and many that didn't want to. We returned to our field, to our sheep, to the mundane but we had been made new and would never again be the same. No way could you have met that baby and not be changed. You should have heard us there in the field. We cut loose. We laughed. We cried. We stood in motionless silence. We hugged. We even talked to our sheep, and we tried to sing and dance. That's when the angel returned and said, That's okay, guys. I know about making a joyful noise, but yours isn't even a happy racket. All I can say is it turned out exactly as we were told. I want to close this message about the moment, about the miracle, with the Scripture John 1.14 from the message, a very modern translation of the Bible. Here's what it says, and I love it. The Word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. We saw the glory with our own eyes, the one-of-a-kind glory, like Father, like Son. Generous inside and out, true from start to finish. Let me read the first part of that again. The Word became flesh and blood, real, touchable. Prick the child with a pen and the child bleeds and moved into the neighborhood. 
I'm here to tell you, folks, Jesus came to live not just in our neighborhood, not just in our homes, but in our individual hearts. That's where he most wants to abide. But that choice is yours. He's not going to knock down the door to get in. He may cause you to trip as you're going through the door to get your attention. But you've got to be the one to invite him. There's another scripture that says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone will hear my voice, open the door, let me in. Together we'll sup. And it goes on to speak how close the two can become. I'm here to tell you in three words what Christmas was about, what it continues to be about. I remember our oldest son, born almost 50 years ago. That was back in the day where many people, (laughs) uh, fathers, when they'd have a son, they'd give out a cigar. That was just a token of, I've had a son, okay? Uh, I wasn't into that. What I did, that was also back in the day where you could buy a roll of Lifesavers for a nickel, which obviously you can't do now. Pastoring a couple of churches at that time, bought enough rolls of Lifesavers that on Christmas Sunday as folks were leaving, I handed them one, each and every one. And with each gift I gave, I spoke these three words. It's a boy. I'm here to tell you today. Years ago, I can't tell you. I don't know how accurate our calendar is. You know, we're, we call ourselves in year 2022. Soon to flip it over to 2023. If it's accurate, okay, over 2,000 years ago. If it's not, it still doesn't matter. I'm here to say, it's a boy. You've blessed us at A Better Life, Brianna's Hope, our our parent group that Faith in Your Recovery is an outreach of. You've blessed us every time you've turned tuned into a podcast, every time you've told a friend about our podcast. Every time you've subscribed, you've liked, you've shared, any time you think of us and lift us up in prayer, and I can honestly say, and you can go back and listen to the previous 60 episodes, we don't get on here to ask for money, and I'm not going to do that here either. I'm not trying to trick you into any kind of thing. But you show us your your thanks toward us simply by giving us a few moments of your time. Would you continue to do that with us in the next year? We see opportunities for growth to continue to touch, change, and save lives. And that's what we want to be about. We have been blessed. We found out just a week ago, let me, since this will be aired here couple weeks from now, the very first part, it was actually on December 1st. We found out through podstatus.com that the Faith in Your Recovery podcast among all Apple podcasts in the United States, and Apple's the number one podcast at this time, but in all of the not-for-profit category of those that's on Apple over the previous 30 days. That would have been the month of November. We were number 53 in the United States. That just, (laughs) that gives me spirit chills sharing it with you. But it's because you folks who've tuned in and turned on to it, and I went through that list earlier. We're on a radio station out of Portland, Indiana, 100.9 on Sunday mornings at 7.45 a.m. as a part of the the worship list that they have for those folks getting ready to go to church. 
We've got a couple others that we believe we're going to be able to get to. But that reminds me of something else. You're going to experience something a little different this year at Christmas as it falls on a Sunday. Some churches have voted, decided they will not have worship because of that. I'm not here to judge that one way or the other. I know many will be open, but regardless, one of the reasons we're sharing this episode on the radio on Christmas Sunday is to help if you're one of those who chooses not to go. And if you do go, it just gives you another dose of God and Jesus, and I hope a Merry Christmas. So I want to leave you with a thought of thank you for allowing us the privilege of being a part of your life. And I invite you to share this holy day, holiday, with those you love, and above all, lift up Christ and know that he's thinking of you. And remember those three words. It's a boy. Amen. God bless you. Thank you.